Welcome to the blind zone. What is the blind zone you say? It's something that comes upon you all of a sudden or it's something you refuse to see that was right in front of your face. And today's topic is going to be an interesting topic and I put, uh, I titled this the cat's out of the bag and you'll find out in a minute. So I'm going to discuss a background that you need to know for this topic and what brought about this video today, what prompted that, and then just something that I've been thinking about where I think it correlates to something else. So let me start. Um, and all of, all of my friends know this information, but for those of you who don't, back in 2001, I lost my vision and it started as a central central scotoma, which is the center part of my vision was missing. And I went to a lot of doctors and they had no reason why it happened. And then they said that half of my optic nerves had died. So whatever was there shooting the information in my brain was no longer there. And within about six, six to nine months at the outset, I had gone from legally blind to light perception only. So at this point I can see if it's light or if it's dark, I don't see any shapes or colors or movement. And most of the time it looks like a blinding white snowstorm. So I'm not black blind where I don't, everything is black. It, again, it's just a blinding white snowstorm. And I'll tell you in a few minutes what again prompted this discussion. So again, that's a little bit of the background. And let me, let me start off by saying, I'm not uh, complaining about this. I'm not trying to, ex, you know, be big and bad and bold about this. I'm just telling you from the truth of my experience. So back in 01, when I lost my vision, I had been married about five years to David. So this came as a surprise to both of us. And at that point I was working at the church and I continued to work there, but I was finishing my undergrad work. And so I knew that I wanted to finish that before the rest of my vision failed. So I quit the job at the church and I went back and finished my undergrad. And then at some point the church hired me back and I had, you know, I had done that job for you know, a number of years. And in the interim, I had asked the, the state where I lived if they could send somebody out that could help me navigate some things that I was unaware of. And so they sent out this lady and she was very helpful. And after she left, I thought, well, I could probably do that. So I checked around and Western Michigan University had a program specifically for the blindness and low vision field. So I applied and was admitted. So again, I had done undergrad work and I had no idea what master's work involved. So for the first semester, I signed up for five master's classes. And after a while, people stopped asking me how I was doing because all I could say is, well, I've stopped crying at least. So you have to understand, I'm doing this work while having no vision, but because of ADA rules in the school, they really work well with their students to make sure that you're on a level playing field with everybody else, you know, which is as it needs to be. And so, in fact, I only requested a couple of things, accommodations as they're called. And one was for more time taking a test, a reader and a scribe if I needed it, if the test was um, unacceptable, it, if it was in a format that was not uh, confident for me and that my books would be in some format that I could use such as Kindle or Audible or whatever they needed to do. Because if it was a print book, that was of no real use to me. So I did that. I went to school in, got there in 2007, and I graduated in December of 08 as a vision rehabilitation therapist. And so then I started to look around for work. And I found a job in a different state, and, and their job was for a teacher for children with visual impairments. That's a TCVI. So I moved down there with anticipation of doing that job and they required another degree. So I went back to Western and got my second master's as a TCVI. Now this is where I have to be totally honest and that really wasn't a good fit for me work-wise, but I did it for four years and then my contract was not renewed, which was fine. We were both pretty much done with that. 
but during that time in 2011, my husband had been, been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So it was probably a good thing that I was home because his cancer treatments were taking up a lot of time. But during these two stints with doing my master's work, I learned a lot in the field, obviously. And then because of practical reasons, you know, having been uh, blind, visually impaired, since 01, I knew purposefully, you know, what things I found helpful to help me navigate. Because the one thing I didn't want to be was so dependent on people that they would look at their screen when I called and said, oh no, what's she calling about now? So again, I, I'm not complaining at all about the vision loss and I'm just trying to explain. And it's not been a fun bed of roses all the time. And yes, there are times I'm frustrated, but thanks to technology, I can really do a lot of things. And obviously I graduated with two masters after having lost my vision. And, and again, I'm not trying to push myself on a pedestal and have you all applaud and wave a flag. That's not the purpose. And I'll get to the reason for this in a minute. So then in 2015, I was sitting there and I recognized that I didn't just want to be on my husband's cancer journey. I was going to be there to support him, but I needed something to do that was going to be for me. So uh, I applied for and was accepted at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I started that in, um, in, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Well, what year? Anyway, so in 15, 2015, I'm sorry. So in 16, I started the, the coursework in earnest and I was going for a master's in biblical theology. So I continued to do that and I continued to deal with my husband's cancer. And then in 2018, he had died. And so at that point I had stopped the coursework for DTS because my husband's uh, health had deteriorated so quickly. I couldn't possibly do both. So I contacted the school and they said I could put on hold whatever else I had done up to that point. And when I rejoined the school, then they would give me back everything that I had already done, which is fine by me. So then in December of uh, 2019, I graduated from DTS with my master's in biblical theology. And again, I'm not telling you all that to pat myself on the back and show you what a great and fabulous blind person I am. I'm just telling you that, that I have learned a lot of things in this journey. And in fact, being blind has actually made me a much nicer person. And I was very much a porcupine. I was very much a prickly pear. I, I was very independent. There was nobody telling me anything. But now as a blind person, you have to rely on other people. You have to say to them, hey, if you're going to the store, can I go with you? Or you have to find ways around because obviously in, in my state anyway, I don't know about yours, but they don't let blind people drive. So I, I needed transportation. I needed to do whatever it was. But again, God was very, very faithful to me. And even when I worked at the church, I never missed a day of work because I didn't have a ride. So I always had rides to and from the school where I worked um, as a TCVI. And I did that job for four years and never missed a day of work because of transportation. And again, God be the glory because a lot of this, and, and early on in this, once I knew I was losing my vision, I had said, I understand that God knows exactly what I'm doing and why I'm like this. So I'm going to just say that whatever he needs for me to do in my current blind state, I'll be happy to do it. And so that, you know, the attitude adjustment was huge. And I stopped seeking doctors for answers that, you know, because none of them could ever tell me why I lost my vision. They all said it must have been a virus. And we all know how that plays out in today's world. So they just didn't know. And that was fine. I didn't need anything more from them than what I had already gotten. So the reason I'm telling you all this, and at this point, every guest that's been on there on, on the blind zone has known about my vision issues. But I've said, don't bring it up because it's a non thing. It's because with my vision loss, I can still speak, I can still write, and I can still read. Now, there are some things, like I said, I cannot do, and I do ask for help. In fact, the blind zone wouldn't be possible without my production manager, Kelly, or my executive assistant, Cindy, who, without their help, this wouldn't get, be possible because some of the technology, while 90% efficient for me, 
there's a 10% gap that just can't be filled. And thanks to my cousin's husband, my cousin Kathleen, her husband, Tim, he sat down one time when we were all away on vacation and go, showed me all the ins and outs of the iPad. And that liberated me in a way that, you know, I, I found just, I, I have thanked him a million times for that because without him, I would be fur, much further behind in the technology curve than I am. And a couple of months ago, I had applied for a job at a local institution that helps uh, visually impaired people. But in talking to the man, he said to me, well, we're coming up to the time where it's the holidays and so a lot of our clientele are going to call off and then it'll be cold and then they'll call off. And I thought, I don't want to spend my time babysitting people who don't want the most for themselves. And I don't want to coax them like a one-year-old trying to get them to walk when these are their choices. So this brings me to the reason with why I'm doing this today. And this is really painful. And again, I'm not telling you all this to, to spotlight how fabulous I am. I'm just spotlighting. I'm just telling you this to spotlight that I saw a problem and I sought solutions and I found some very good solutions. But in the time that I've uh, been visually impaired, I've run into, I don't know, let's, let's say an average of 40 people. Uh, blindness and low vision is a small, a small incidence population. So we're not a big group of people, but we're enough that I run into enough people. And I always ask them the same questions. What kind of help did you need? What kind of help did you receive after you got your diagnosis? And the answer was always the same. Hardly none. And it, it was like, two out of 10 that said, oh yeah, my doctor recommended me to go to this, that, or the other. So I was like, well, that's ridiculous. You're entitled to some services. The state has this money set aside. And so I would give them some things that they should think about. Or if they just had a question about what they were doing that caused them problems, I said, oh, well, I can help you solve that. And you know, you tell me the problem you're having, and I can give you at least two solutions, maybe more. And this is the part that I, I just shake my head. I, I just don't understand. Every person, every visually impaired or blind person I have ever met, I have ever met, when I give them the solution, I ask later, did you do that? Everyone said, no, I didn't do that. And when I prod them further, it's like, well, why not? And then they said, well, I didn't think it'd work, I, you know, whatever, whatever. And so they always had a reason why, why they weren't going to use the advice I had given them. And maybe they didn't trust me with the advice, but this is what I always thought. Well, the least you could have done was given it a shot. And then you could have come back to me and said, Denise, you know, your, your theory is full of holes because it didn't work for me. And then I would have tried to come up with something else. So what prompted this was I had been dealing with somebody over a different issue and I found out that this person had a visual impairment. And I said, what kind of services have you received? And they said, services? I haven't gotten any services. I was like, there are so many things out there for you. So I gave them a recommendation to do three things. I laid them all out and I said, now look, I'm not going to I said, I can be like a dog at the bone with this. I can harp and harp and harp and, and cajole you. But if, unless you want to do this, I said, I'll ask one more time, but I won't continue to bug you about this because I know from whence I speak, I've had practical experience where agencies have helped me. When I moved here, I needed uh, this organization to come alongside me and I got their orientation and mobility gal to come out and show me cane training for the areas that were new to me. You know, that's just, cane training is really a difficult thing. And in fact, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a lazy blind person because when I'm going out with somebody, I just, I just use them as my sighted guide because caning takes a lot of concentration. It's eyeballs on a stick. So where your cane goes, you're going, but if you're sweeping right and there's a hole left, you know, it's just easier to go sighted guide, hang on to somebody's arm, walk a step behind them. You feel where they go, you go with them. And again, lazy blind person, not gonna, not gonna discount that at all. 
But so anyway, back to my point, and I do have one. So after this person saying, no, I didn't do any of your suggestions, and they had a lot of reasons why, none of them were good. And so they basically cemented themselves into a wall that unless they change, things will never get any better or different for them. They have to want to want this. So that brought me to the idea that, you know, my faith is really, really important to me. My faith in Jesus Christ and my Christian faith and the fact that I'm a believer. And I thought, well, this might be like that. When Jesus said, all you are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and take my yoke upon you and I will give you rest. And when I hear people struggling in, in life circumstances, and I talk to them about you know, having faith and turning to God and his son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, they wave me off like, well, that's just crazy. And I thought, well, now, again, I'm not suggesting I'm just like Jesus, but when I tell people perfectly reasonable things to do and they don't do it, I can't do anything but shake my head and wonder why. And so the same thing with my faith. When I tell people what really could be helpful for them, because we all have times in our life when things break down and we need assistance. And, and not that my Christianity is a crutch and I only pull it out when I have a, a problem. It has turned into uh, my, life, my life goal. And it's something that is my foundation. But a lot of times, if you don't have that faith, all you need to do is lean in and turn in that direction. And, and God will just sweep you up in his arms. So I guess the correlation is when I give people really good advice about being visually impaired or blind and the things that they can do to help themselves and they don't take it, nothing I can do about that. And likewise, when Jesus says, come unto me, all you are heavy laden. And if they don't choose to do that, you can't do anything with that either because he's a gentleman. He's not going to get pushy or loud or proud or he's not going to do anything that's going to force you to do anything that you don't want to do. And I had to reason that out with the people who I've given perfectly good suggestions to based on a multitude of uh, information that I, I knew it worked. So <laughs> I guess all this to say, again, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining. So wherever this lands with you, I just hope that you hear my heart that I do really want the best for people and whether it's helping people in their guided decision about if they're visually impaired or blind or help them into a guided decision about their faith. That's what I want. I just want the best for people. And after this airing, um, I'll go back to, we're never going to talk about my blindness again on the blind zone because it's, it's not even applicable. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yes, I need help. Yes. People help me do this so that it comes out in a relatively good way. But I don't need to have vision to see with my heart the things that God has wanted me to do. So that's it for today. And uh, the cat's out of the bag now. Now you all know. And <laughs> I, I don't know, again, I don't know where this story lands with you, but it was something I felt I really needed to share. So I'm not going to tell you who's up next because I have no idea. But again, we'll see you next week on The Blind Zone. <laughs>